who are one of the early attendees, um, then just hang tight and we'll get started at the top of the hour. Okay, we're just about to get started. Give one more minute for a few more people to show up, and then we'll kick things off. While you're doing that, I'll go ahead and let people know that we're live. One thing I like to do at the beginning of the show is just make sure that everybody can hear the audio. So can you, if you can hear me, go chat that you can hear the audio just fine. Okay, so no one has said they can hear the audio. Aha. Now people have said they can hear it. Great. We're just about to get started. All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is our fifth episode of Startup Growth Club. We're a group of startup founders and teams who want to get together and learn more about how to be successful. My name is Justin. I'm the founder of UpFocus, and UpFocus helps early stage companies, companies understand their customers through feedback and qualitative research so you can build the right product. And it's based on many of the concepts that are covered in this book. And over the last four weeks, we've read Hacking Growth in four parts, one part per week. And now, one of the authors, Sean Ellis, is here to join us for a live Q&A, and I'm really excited. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. One, if you're enjoying the show today, we'd love for you to share with more people while you're during you know, the show here, and use our hashtag, the Startup Growth Club, that you'll see in the lower left corner. And uh, also, today's show, this is really about you. It's you that we want to hear from. Um, I have some questions for Sean, but he'd really like to be able to know what are the things that you either had questions about in the book, um, you know, or what you thought about things that you read in the book. And so if you want to be able to raise your hand and participate in today's show, uh, then we have in the lower right corner here, a little red button where you can click raise your hand. And once you do, just like in Clubhouse, then I can bring you up on the screen you can ask Sean questions or share some of your thoughts about the book. Also, we have a group that we have been you know, discussing in between the show called Goodreads. 
And uh, we'll drop the link here in the chat. So if you want to be able to join us there, uh, we'd like to maybe even do more of these books, um, book shows and want to hear what you think about it. Okay. Uh, finally, we're, we are going to be recording today's show. We'll have that available on our YouTube channel. So we'll post the link in the chat here. So you can join us there if you want to be able to catch the recording of this show or see some of the ones that led up to this show. Um, and you can subscribe. All right. And with that, um, Sean, if you go ahead and raise your hand, then I'll bring you up onto the screen and uh, we'll have us get started here. All right. Let me get you. Made me nervous. Okay. I, raised, I raised my hand a little while ago. I got nervous that you weren't seeing it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. I uh, I probably should have just checked first, but yeah. <laughs> welcome to the show, Sean. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. It's good to be on. You, uh, you're a busy man today. You're just coming fresh off of a lecture that you just provided. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. I was uh, a group in Europe, so I was up early, and uh, but fortunately, that means I'm awake for this, so. It's good. Instead of my normal oh, nice. sleep until noon day. No, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> well, such is the life when you are as accomplished a person as you are, um, having helped grow multiple companies into billion dollar companies and having worked with hundreds of startups. And you shared along with Morgan Brown, a lot of those great tips in this book, Hacking Growth, and really excited to be able to have you join the show. Um, and for anyone that is just joining us. Um, this is intended to be a live Q&A. I have some questions. So if those of you in the audience are waiting for your moment to be able to raise your hand, in the lower right corner, we've got that red button where you can do that. If you raise your hand, we'll bring you up. And I know Sean wants to be able to hear from all of you. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. It's, uh, it's, it's good to be on. I'm excited for this. Excellent. Well, to get us started, we have been following along with a few of our, our members who have been reading the book in Goodreads, and so they've given us a few starting questions. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those comes from Johannes, and he wanted to know, um, is there a practical way to figure out the aha moment within your project? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe start off by just for those who uh, maybe don't remember what the aha moment is or didn't catch that part, um, you know, share what that is, and then would love to hear your thoughts on how do you how do you practically find that moment? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, you know, aha moment is is a really important concept in growth. It's it's essentially, you know, if you think about um, all of the different levers of growth, almost always the first one that I focus on is the aha moment. It is the it is kind of the bridge that sits between product and marketing and, uh, and, and where most companies get it wrong that basically, you know, you get a, a, a marketing team that, that, that brings in lots of people and just kind of throws them over the fence to product. And then product is, is thinking, you know, if we make this product awesome, people will love it. And we just need to focus on making it awesome. And that no one's kind of thinking about how, what's the, what's, the point at which someone realizes that it's awesome. How do you how do you shape that initial experience with the product? And so that's what we call the aha moment. That initial experience with the product, where where the user uh, literally or or figuratively says, "Aha! I get it. This is what this is all about." And so what you're trying to figure out is what is what is that first experience that is is truly a taste of the value that, that has to come. And I think the, I'll, I'll start with the mistake of, of how I think people try to figure it out, which is they, they start to, uh, they start to study the data. They, they, they just look at, they look at all, all the data they can find around the initial experience with the product. And they, and they start to try to at least find a, a correlation to when people do this, are they are they more likely or less likely to be long term retained and um, and maybe you can find something that way but I I've never approached it that way so what I what I do is I I start more qualitatively I just you know intuitively look at 
And it feels strange to say, instead of the data, lean toward intuitively. That's not, <laughs> those aren't the words that people would necessarily associate me saying, but I, I think it's, it's, um, it's a hypothesis where you're ultimately saying, um, I think this is where someone gets enough value. And so you're, mm -hmm. you're basically looking at, you know, what, well, I'll give you an example. When I was with log me in, um, our, our aha moment was really the first time you did a remote control session. And, and we talk about that in the book in, in the introduction. So the very first time that you actually start controlling another computer, you're like, wow, I get this. This is, this is amazing. And so um, it's easy to kind of work backwards and say, all right, before that, what are the steps? Um, they need to register. They need to download software. They need to configure firewalls. They need to, you know, there was all kind of all these other things. And is there value associated with any of those? The answer is pretty clearly no. And, and so then it's, you know, for, for that one, it was pretty easy to figure out that it's, you know, if they, it, it wasn't until they used the product in, in that way that they, that they really experienced it in a way that, that they would come back. So that's what I, I start with is just like, just kind of study the experience and, and, and try to figure out what is the, what is the likelihood? And maybe you come up with two or three potential aha moments. And then the next thing you want to do is, is to see, is there a correlation to long-term retention when they do those things? And so, you know, yeah. correlation is not causation. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that doing those things is what caused them to stay long term. So the only way to really validate causation is is through experiments. And so maybe you remove that step, maybe uh, try something else and and that that ultimately that's where you can start to figure out, okay, this is what I see people doing that when they do that, they're much more likely to be long term retained. And when I get more people to experience that, by maybe moving that even further up in the in the in the process, do we see that long-term retention? Or maybe when I even remove it, does it have any effect on long-term retention? And you know, some things are going to be kind of hard to remove, like the the log me in example that I just gave. Can can you remove yeah. doing a, a first-time uh, user experience? But um, so sometimes even like you know, it, it, you can try to simulate it, the the experience as much as possible. But I, I I tend to think it's very experiential. So um, hopefully that yeah. that gives some some directional uh, guidance in how to approach that. Yeah, that that's super helpful. And thank you for giving all that context on on understanding what the aha moment is. Um, so another question that we got from the Goodreads book club comes from Daniel. And he was pointing out, you know, around sort of how do you know if the team is doing well? And he's like, you know, it seems like a growth team might strike out, you know, nine times before they hit a home run on the 10th one. And so kind of given that uncertain number of uh, experiments that you have to hit before success, it tells you you're doing a good job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think about that example from from HubSpot, the sidekick. Um in fact, actually, Daniel just raised his hand here, so let me let me just bring him up for a second and uh, and have him kind of weigh in. Oh, hey, hey. Daniel. how you doing, Daniel? Happy Tuesday. Good to meet you, Sean. Good to meet you for having me on the call. So I wanted to chime in because I think I have a better question, or at least a question oh, that right. I'm more keen to have answered. Um, so the question I have is. Well, to kind of paint the picture, the in reading the book, I kind of felt like I maybe picked up on, um, you know, growth team really has to have the buy-in of the executive leadership team mm -hmm. because they just kind of operate like a rogue band across the entire mm -hmm. product and business, or at least that's one way that it can go about. Um, and so I was kind of curious what you saw as advantages or disadvantages of having a dedicated growth team versus trying to make that growth part of the mission of each um, individual product team. Yeah, um, you know, it's really hard to know kind of what's right for, for any one business. I think the, um, 
you know, I'm going I'm to kind of combine that even with the with the question that you had posted earlier to, to kind of bring it into like, you know, ultimately what does success look like? And then, and then what does the role, you know, what, what are ways to drive that success, either dedicated or, or as, as part of the broader um, growth mission. So I think the, if we start with success, you know, ultimately success, growth is a scary role because ultimately success is in the title growth. And if there's no growth, yeah, it's pretty hard to say you're doing a good job in, in a growth role. So, um, I, you know, but, but growth is ultimately the output. So the alternative is there could be lots of growth and it could have nothing to do with the growth team. And so that also kind of is failure in my mind. So, so, so ultimately, um, ultimately you, if you're going to have a growth team, you want to have a growth team that, positively affects the growth rate in the business. And so um, I, by the time a number hits a chart, it's, there's not much you can do about it. If that, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of the lagging indicator of everything that you did upstream from that. And so, so really what you're, what you're managing your time and your efforts and, and your organization on is, is the input side. So the input side is um, comes back to this, Second question then is, is it better to be um, kind of embedded as part of the, as part of the, the, you know, product organization? Is it better to have a standalone growth team? Um, I don't think there's like a one size fits all there, but I know that if you, if you aren't running experiments at all, then you're doing it wrong. And so that's, that's going to be part of it is that, you know, what, what is the organization that actually sets you up to run experiments? And then obviously just running experiments is not, is not enough. It needs to be experiments that drive impact. And so then you want to, you want to ultimately say, um, you know, like I, I think if you, a lot of times if you have a dedicated growth team, that's sort of a marketing team with a different name, then I'll tell you where the experiments will be. They're all going to be top of funnel. And that's kind of what a good marketing team does anyway. You know, good marketing team should be running lots of ad tests and maybe landing page tests. And so ultimately then impact comes down to where do I have permission to run the tests and where is the highest potential impact opportunity to run tests and what's the organization that's going to allow me to run those tests? And then, and then how, how, how do I actually run those tests? And so, um, so, so it's kind of a, a combination of kind of permission and, um, and abilities, if that makes sense. So a traditional marketing team is, is rarely going to be able to, to conceptualize and launch an in product test. And so in that case, then, then they're going to need to at least partner with the product team or hire the skills to be able to do it internally. But um, I, I don't think that there's even necessarily a one size fits all there, but hopefully I haven't confused everything in this answer so far. But if I, if I were to zoom out, that ultimately what I would say is, is you want to be able to run tests that drive positive acceleration in the business and that that requires both buy-in and permission to run them. So look at all of the different potential growth levers, and you want to be able to focus your energies on the growth levers that's going to make the most impact. And, and then you want to be able to run enough tests on that lever to ultimately figure out how, how to effectively accelerate growth through that lever. And so obviously it's not always just focusing on a single lever, but it is always a, at, at any given point, there's a very best opportunity and you want to put enough energy and resources behind that opportunity. And what I have, the biggest frustration that I've seen out of teams is when, when they don't have permission to focus on that lever that could, could have a lot of potential impact. And so the permission piece is either how do I buy how do I drive buy-in from those who have control on that? Or how do I get control over that? Um, but that's, you know, and then, then what is the 
ideal right organization for that it's it's hard to hard to say because sure. every company is going to be different hopefully i really like the framing of um permission and and uh potential or highest impact though kind of look in your terrain of hey what are the different numbers that we have the potential uh to impact and which is mm -hmm. the highest potential yeah and so that that's where i think if you you know that's where you really want to diagram what what the growth model for the business looks like and one of the things that I've found that helps to drive buy-in then is to diagram that growth model as a team, not as a, not as a growth team, but as a, as a company team. And so when you have this shared, shared understanding of growth across the team, then, then it becomes easier to work together collaboratively to, to drive growth. And then, and then ultimately, even just the engine isn't enough. You need to be able to say, what metric is that engine focus on moving and why is that metric important? And ideally that the ultimate metric should be your North star metric. And so even, so it shouldn't even just be a collaborative effort to figure out what the engine looks like. It should be a collaborative effort to figure out what your North star metric looks like. And so if I, if I were to say that, yeah, I, maybe I've already just said this, but the, the biggest frustration that I've seen from people who've read the book um, is they buy into it, but their organization does not, their company does not. Sure. And, and, and they're, they, they, they feel like they have the perfect way to, way to approach growth, but um, without, without the organization being on board, they, they fail and get frustrated. And so that's, what I have spent a lot of the last few years doing is going in to companies and, and basically helping them get on the same page around why is growth important? Growth is impact. Growth is impact on mission. And then what does the engine look, what does the metric look like that reflects that? What does the engine look like that moves that metric? And then how do we work together across the team to, to drive improvement on that engine? Awesome. And uh, sorry, I, realized as soon as i got on video my son charlie is home from school today <laughs> i love that as long as you stuff those drums it'll be yeah. fine <laughs> more fashion i see him like doing cartwheels and flips off the <laughs> thanks john sure thanks for that great question daniel yeah. all right um that's that's excellent i love this theme because i think it is kind of the key point um that other people have made which is this ball sounds great, but how do you actually make it happen? Mm -hmm. um, potentially with us today is Adam Duvander. I know he had a question on uh, good reads. Adam, I'll go ahead and represent your question. If you're here, feel free to raise your hand and uh, you know, happen to uh, happy to bring you up on on screen. Um, but his question, you know, if if you are having trouble getting your organization to buy in, you know. Is there a way to get started where maybe you can do a small activity, some kind of a small test mm -hmm. that the proof of that becomes something that you can use to justify, you know, a bigger uh, organizational buy in or commitment to growth? Uh, do you got any examples where you've seen that work or uh, even mm -hmm. warning stories of where you've seen that not work? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, in fact, you and I talked about this, this one example recently. Um, I, you know, one company that I worked with in the, in the gaming space, um, years ago, they, uh, they had a really hard onboarding issue with the product, a really big onboarding issue with the product, which was, it was really hard to get started with the product. And, um, it's, yeah. you know, that's game, you know, if you think about like, how a game should be kind of angry birds is sort of the, the classic example of, you know, watching even like my mother get addicted to angry birds. It's just, it's so dead simple in the beginning that like, Oh, this is so easy, but it, it progressively gets harder and harder and just keeps sucking you in by progressively getting harder, but it's really, really easy in the beginning. And so um, I remember, you know, when I, when I started working with this company, I saw in the data just a massive drop off from, you know, first time they tried to use it to never returning again. Just the the retention cohorts were awful in the business. And um, and so I shared that with the product team and the feedback was like, okay, thanks for sharing it. Like, 
kind of kind of we don't care was sort of the the reaction that I got. And so I thought, okay, I'm not gonna give up because this is a big opportunity for this business. So I, I ran some surveys and I had my hypothesis, which was it's just too hard to use in the beginning on this product. And so I ran the surveys and yep, that's what the surveys said. The surveys came back and just people said, I just couldn't figure out how to use it. It just wasn't fun. I got frustrated. And so I thought, okay, now I'm armed with some survey data. And I brought that to the product team. And again, the big yawn, like, you know, we, I could, I can show you so many customers who absolutely love this. You're, you're wrong. Like, just we we're we're building based on the customers that already love this and and so like okay what else can i do and then i thought okay i'm going to i'm going to actually try to get at least one person having this frustrating experience and and uh and and get them to uh to 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 film it so i started it by i signed up for usertesting.com and did about 10 sessions where I literally just said, just go in and play the game for the first time, go in and play the game. And, and very quickly I had some super frustrated people trying to, trying to use the product. And it was a, it was a golf game and it, they were literally trying to hit the golf ball and throwing F bombs left and right and really frustrated with it. And so I played them just two of those videos, the product team, so I've, I've shown this like statistical significance backed up by surveys, no interest. They see first one, then a second of people trying to use the game, extremely frustrated. And they're like, oh my God, drop everything. We need to fix this. And so I think part, part of it is, um, part of it is really just uh, being able to, to clearly articulate a problem and, you know, problem and opportunity are just, you know, two sides of the same coin. And so um, sometimes presenting it as an opportunity doesn't, doesn't get people's attention, but when they, when they see a problem and they buy into it, that's that there's a problem, they're not going to buy into your solution because you don't even know what your, what the right solution is. And that's, that's, that's kind of hopefully came across in the book is that you can have lots of ideas for potential mm. solutions, but that's what the whole testing process is about. But no one cares about the solutions if they don't buy into the problem existing. And so you have to sometimes sell the problem. So that's one way to, to get the buy-in is when you actually get people to buy in that it's fundamentally broken somewhere in our product. And that, that helps a lot. And then the second uh, would be if you focus on areas that you do have control over and you share the wins that you get when you're focusing in those in those areas, that those wins can help buy you credibility to extend the process more deeply. So I, I would probably work on on both of those, but I think if you just start with the I'm going to focus on the areas where I have the ability to experiment, a lot of times you're never going to get out of that area, and it's just it's just easy to get lazy and just just work within that area, and and that often the biggest levers for true rapid growth acceleration are are some of the hardest areas because they sit between departments. Yeah, that that's a great example, and, and three tactical elements there. One, you know, you had the the data that showed here's the drop off then two you know you had the survey results and then you had the you know the the videos that really give you that emotional connection to what's happening to the yes. user uh, do you think it was important that you had all three or if you'd have started with just the videos you think you'd have i might have worked if i started the videos there. but yeah to me it was uh to me, it was just more of just that frustration of like i know there's a so that's that's part of the growth side of things you have to have that conviction that I know there's an opportunity here and I know it's going to be hard to get the team on board to, to put energy there, but it's so important that I'm going to, I'm going to keep trying and, and keep harping on it until, until we can do it. I have a, a, a different example from my time at Dropbox where um, when I went in, there was uh, there was basically not a, I, it was all engineers on the team and myself and um I, I basically from my, at my previous company really didn't have much buying and trust from the product team or the engineering team and, and was 
being super deliberate in my first week at Dropbox about how, how am I, what am I going to do to get that buy-in and trust so that we can think holistically about growth in this business? And so um, I, I, I did a lot of that analysis up front. So I, I, um, I joined the week it was coming out of private beta. I ran a survey almost every day to a, a, a different group of users. So I said, okay, how many, how many private beta users do we have here? Let's break that up into a whole bunch of little lists and just surveyed every day, set up the tracking, studied usage, identified the opportunities, and then conceptualized the experiments, worked with the CEO to explain why each of those experiments are important. But I basically scripted out the first 10 experiments that I knew if I, if I tried to sell it one experiment at a time, that the, you know, if I go three experiments that all fail, people are going to give up on the process. So I needed to sell 10 experiments. And if I could get 10 experiments that were really well thought out, the chances that I get some good wins in those 10 experiments would be pretty high. And so a lot of them were onboarding. Like, as I said, I, I think a lot of the early opportunities are in that, in that activation phase. And so I got the 10 experiments very well documented based on the research, talk, talk to the CEO, CEO and I then so, sold it to the engineers um, and we got enough wins in those first 10 experiments that very quickly it's math engineers understand math yeah. really well. So very quickly they were like, Holy crap, I see how this works. And then they started coming up with the ideas and, and really the majority of experiment ideas from that point on came from the engineering team when it's their idea, they're really excited about implementing it. And, uh, and, you know, kind of fast forward, uh, I, I actually interviewed their worldwide head of growth at a conference uh, or head of marketing at a conference um, probably eight years after the time I was there. And she said, one of the first things she said, what's unique about Dropbox is that everyone takes ownership of growth. And, uh, and so, yeah, that was something we were super deliberate about in the beginning. And, and Dropbox uh, at one time was the fastest SaaS business to reach a billion dollar revenue run rate. And I think it was really baking in super early, getting everyone on the team to, 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 to take ownership of growth and really care about growth and understand how it worked. Yeah, you know, that last part kind of goes a little bit back to what Daniel was asking around how, you know, is it better to have sort of a permanent team or, um, you know, a temporary one or a dedicated one or everybody yeah. in the team? And I think the best, is, start. I think the best is like everybody, everybody totally cares about growth and, and works cohesively together to drive growth. It's just, it's how do you get there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a, not everybody has the option, the luxury of being able to start there. So yeah. yeah. Uh, and unfortunately I when I was at Dropbox, there was eight people. So that's the benefit of starting yeah. with a really small team is, uh, you know, culture is, is not as, uh, as, as fixed at that point. It's still malleable to, to hopefully, hopefully get people aligned in a way that they can effectively work together to drive growth. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Um, all right, let's take one quick step back. And as we do, just for those of you who are tuning in, if you want to, again, join us up here on stage, then please go ahead and click that red raise your hand button. I know Sean would love to hear either your questions or your thoughts on the book. This is a unique opportunity to get a chance to be able to chat with him. Um, if you are camera shy or not, not wanting to be on screen, you can also just drop a uh, question in the chat. Um, we'll also be monitoring the comments left on YouTube, um, and then we'll drop those into chat so we can work those in. And while I'm waiting for some of those questions from you, I, I wanted to ask you a question around, um, you know, the, the must have test, you know, what I think mm -hmm. we refer to now as sort of the product market fit survey. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's one of the first things that you cover in the book. Yeah. Um, is this something that everybody should do. Um, and, and actually, uh, I have, I have a person here who has raised their hand. So let me, let me see if that's their question. If not, we'll come right back to that one. Okay. Sounds good. Let me bring Ben up here. Uh, hey, hey guys, guys. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah. Hey, take take a moment to this. introduce yourself and then uh, we'd love to hear your, your questions or thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is Ben Freeman. I'm a product manager at a company called Sonar, which is part of a, a parent company called MarchX. And I uh, worked with Justin in the past. Uh, I'm really excited to see what he's doing at, at UpFocus and follow you guys. And I've been really excited to pick up the book, Sean. I'm, I'm not very far into it. I got a little bit more to go, but um, you know, this is an awesome opportunity to, to come in and ask a question. So thank you both. Of course. Pretty cool. Um, if you don't mind, I'd love to chat a little bit about or hear you chat a little bit about um, growth tactics and specifically how you've maybe tweaked some growth tactics for business to business mm -hmm. companies. Um, in my experience shared with Justin, we were in B2B types of tech SaaS products um, and specifically, you know, found in a couple of different instances, our, you know, our core users have been not the same persona that maybe would decide what tool mm -hmm. to use or to buy our product. And mm -hmm. I felt balancing that and managing that to be challenging. So I'd love to just, yeah, hear you chat about maybe some examples of how you've, uh, if you've encountered that before and, and how you dealt with that. Sure. I, I, interestingly, I, uh, I, I met with a CEO last week that was, uh, that was kind of in a situation. So early stage, but in a situation where he's in B2B and, and they're just, they're scrambling, like, like, I think that they have product market fit. They're scrambling to hit numbers. And I, and I just saw in kind of playing it out that, that they're going to scramble to hit numbers and they're, they're going to hit them for a quarter or two. And then they're going to hit a wall because they are, they're just, they're just driven by kind of like that passion and energy, but just not, not being particularly systematic about it. So one of the first pieces of advice I gave to them was they had three pretty distinct um, user types, customer types on the product, and uh, and where they and and then they basically just had sort of all hands on deck for all types of users. And what what I tend to think is that for a um, for a new company that you yeah you know, initially you're trying to get to product market fit you're trying to create you're trying to validate that whatever you thought would be valuable for people is is going to be valuable enough that they keep using it and then the mistake i see a lot of people make is that once they validate that they jump straight into how do we grow the hell out of this thing and um and that's that's good in the sense that like action is 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 better than <laughs> inaction. And so at least they're like scrambling to grow and maybe they can learn a lot. That enthusiasm can be a good thing. But what I advised to them was break the team into kind of three groups, at least around each of those user types and, and start to think about what's the right experience for each of those user types. Um, one of them had a much lower average transaction size than the other two yet represented a pretty big market. And so, you know, one of his thoughts was let's, let's not focus on that because the transaction size is so small. But, you know, to me, I said, let's, let's think about a, um, a, a no touch funnel on that and what, what a no touch funnel might look like for that group of people. Can you, can you close that business through, through an e-commerce kind of, uh, kind of process where, on the other end, you've, you've essentially one of the things that he one of the, the the red flags that came out was that they were having traffic to their site hit kind of thirty thousand people, whether it's per day or per week, I don't remember. But that they they would literally have like kind of the traffic sometimes double, and it had almost no almost no impact on the number of sales that were being made. And so he's like, maybe I should just add a lot more salespeople, which is not a, not a bad idea, but you know, to, to me, it was kind of like, I, I think you need to, you need to build the growth fly, flywheel for each of the, each of the user types initially. And then, and then you can kind of operationalize growth around that and, and, and scale that. And so I think even before the tactical piece, it's literally it's literally just um, just trying to build trying to build something that is is based on the needs of that particular target early on, and 
that's where I think you can be somewhat intuitive on the initial pass, but too many people, too many people aren't segmenting and they're just literally focusing on what, what is the average best for everything? And let's pour them through a big, a big funnel that can get super messy quickly. Like let's, so my part of my uh, feedback was start to branch it into other funnels if possible. You know, that w- one of those groups is not going to spend a long time filling out forms where another group might understand that they need to fill out forms to get the right offer presented to them. And so very quickly kind of branching maybe by company size. And, um, and then once you, once you at least have it segmented, then trying to try to build that initial flywheel. And then once you have the initial flywheel, then it's how do I drive improvements on that flywheel? And so I use the term flywheel. Now in the book, we, we talk more about the, the growth model or even the fundamental growth equation, but it's essentially what are the key variables that, that move the growth metric for, for that group of people. And, and then, you know, which of those has the most room for improvement then let's come up with a backlog of ideas against that one, start to drive improvement there. And then, you know, then maybe focus on the other one. And then as the company grows, that's where it might make more sense to, to, to have teams that focus on, on just different parts of the journey. So that's, you know, especially in a, in a B2B situation, a lot of times that's where you're going to have customer success teams and um, kind of teams around the different stages. So um, but yeah, from, from a tactical perspective, it's really hard to know specifically which tactics are, are going to, um, be the right tactics, not, not knowing the necessary, the, the business type, but, um, what one, you know, top of funnel is obviously a, a good place to start for a lot of businesses. And that's where, um, for B2B increasingly content marketing is important. I had another another uh, CMO of a of a company that probably do an IPO in the next year, so much different stage. He had a very similar situation, a ton of traffic, top of funnel, and his big question was how do I how do I convert all of this you know traffic into qualified leads? And my my advice for him was. You know, the benefit of content marketing is that it's very impulse oriented. Like someone, it's not a big commitment to go read an article because um, it, if it's bad, I, I read the first paragraph and I drop out, you know, so, um, but, you know, to sign up for a trial of a product is, is a bigger commitment to buy the product is a really big commitment. And so one of the mistakes I see with content marketing is that, um, is that they're, they're kind of trying to get them to the trial in a, in a, in a very unqualified way with the, with the content. And so um, kind of thinking about how do you stack content to where you keep having slightly bigger levels of commitment that, uh, that get them closer to being trial ready or, you know, talk to a salesperson ready. And so um, that's where, Initially, it might be a piece of content, like in, in the training course that I have, uh, Go Practice, um, it's, it's a huge commitment to sign it, not just the dollar commitment, but it's, you know, 100 plus hours of your time to do this thing. And so we have a lot of content at the top of the funnel, but then we came up with a gross skills assessment test that's free, that sits in between that, that lets you know, where are your growth skills? Where are holes in your growth skills? And then, then we map those holes in your growth skills to what the course could do for you. So we have a, a much more kind of qualified pitch about the course based on what your unique needs are. And so that, that would be an example of a kind of tool or content that slips in between very top of funnel content and, and the ask for the trial. So hopefully some of those tactics are helpful. I know that was a mouthful that I just got dumped at you. Yeah, oh, that was great. Thanks so much. I, I've been taking notes along the way and uh, it's really, really interesting to hear some of these examples. Uh, I think the specificity of some examples really helps. It's sticking to my brain. So appreciate cool. it. Thank you very much. Yeah. I unfortunately have the almost IPO level and the, very new out of the gates level. So, so hopefully one of those, uh, 
one of those is is closer to your situation yeah we, i mean in terms of the company stage we're probably not there but i think we need to act like we are uh, which we could um talk about another time but uh, so I, again the example is really helpful thank you again awesome you're welcome thanks ben okay um we've got daniel looks like he's got a follow-up question here so daniel cool. thank you for joining us on the show sorry to take up all the time but i really had to ask this question of course. And the question is, so it's been a, a few years since the book was published. Um, are there any recent learnings that you've had that you're like, oh, I really wish that this was in the book? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, I actually had my co-author, uh, Morgan Brown, who's now a, a VP of growth at uh, Shopify, where I had that same discussion recently on the, uh, on my podcast, he, he, he came on for an interview and I, um, I think both of us kind of had a really hard time finding anything that wasn't in the book. And I, I think that the main reason is that we, we focused on, on a lot of evergreen, uh, concepts. So I think the examples are obviously a lot of the examples there's, there's more, um, recent companies that you could use as examples, but like even, even, you know, the log me in examples from pushing 18 years ago. Now, um, mo most companies fall well short of, of, of that level of, uh, analysis and understanding. And when I, when like I, I just in the, um, uh, university lecture, business school lecture that I just went through, I, I literally just took them through, the log me in case study. And we, we touch on it in the beginning of the book and just said, what would you do in this situation? What would you do in this situation? And, and almost nobody, I mean, it was essentially a case study where I talk about, um, uh, it, I'm stuck on being able to spend $10,000 a month. We've raised $10 million. I have pressure to be able to spend more and we can't. And, uh, talk about what I have on the marketing team and, and, you know, how could, how could we address the, the challenges or what would you do next? And nobody could really kind of hone in on that, that activation was what our issue was. And that when we, when we brought the product team and the marketing team together, when the CEO said, this is the top priority, stop the product development roadmap, stop trying to develop new channels on the marketing side, everybody come together and focus on activation. When we did that, we had a thousand uh, percent improvement in the activation rate, which then unleashed growth in the business. Like, um, so I, I think I think so much of what we focus on was the non-tactical stuff that it is um, that it is really evergreen. If if there is one piece that I, I've touched on already, the frustration that I see is an individual learns this stuff, understands this stuff, and then goes and tries to apply it to their company and gets really frustrated. And so, um, so much of what I've done since, since writing the book is, is trying to figure out how, how do you, how do you get companies on the same page so you can be successful with this? And I, I initially embedded as a consultant with companies, but I found, um, you know, for the first week or two, they're excited on there. And then I'm just another, uh, little ears there. So I won't, won't say some of the words that they, uh, you know, but they, I'm another, um, pain in the butt of, of someone telling me to do things they don't want to do. And, and, uh, and, and then I got just as frustrated. So that what I found was most effective was to literally get the entire team to step out of their day to day where I've literally done entire companies, um, where they spend a full day in a workshop, just getting on the same page around, how growth works, all, all the things that I kind of talked about in the, in the earlier uh, answers to, to questions. And um, to me, to me, that's the, that's the missing piece in the book of just how, how can you get a company in the right frame of mind and in the right culture to actually be able to effectively act on the information that's in the book. Cool. Great. Well, thanks again for sharing your time with us today. Of course. 
Thanks, Daniel. All right. Um, that was a that was a great question. It kind of reminds me a little bit of um, what we talked to, about a little with Anuj and on you know team dynamics and um, you know he he was talking about how the five dysfunctions of a team you know a lot of those principles sort of apply to a, a growth team mm -hmm. and um, you know interesting to hear you say that that's sort of a key thing that you focus on for companies who are wanting to get started you know how do you take it from an individual person who's passionate about it to you know something where you actually have team buy-in and participation because because one of the first things you learn is it's a cross-functional team it's not just somebody with the title that sits yeah. over in the corner and you know pulls levers by themselves yeah so yeah, for sure great well coming back to uh one of the questions that i was teeing up which was around the product market fit survey um yeah. you know or or the the must-have test as it's sort of referred to in the book um is this something that everybody needs to do started you know how do you sort of when do you do that uh I'd kind of hear you sort of say more particularly about how you start using that yeah so so, I mean, I guess that before they get started with starting a business, before they get started with trying to grow the business, so a little bit of uh, oh, sorry, caveat before, on my question. But before they get started with their growth team, you know, is it like, yeah. be, hey, before we know it's time to assemble the growth team and focus yeah. on growth, do you do you run the survey before that moment, or is this yeah. like exercise number one for the growth team? You know, thank you for for that clarification. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I. I think the yeah the very first thing if you if you want to start trying to grow the business is is to run that survey because it um, it ultimately one it can give you the indication is your business in a place where it can even grow um, if you if you have very little use very few users who consider the product a must have um, you know, study your retention cohorts are going to be even more important than what a survey says but if your retention cohorts are all going to zero. The survey reveals that that most people wouldn't care if the product went away. Spending time building a growth team and, and pouring resources into growth, you're, you're probably uh, accelerating your speed toward a brick wall. <laughs> you're, you're just, you know, you're going to waste a lot of money. So um, just even yeah. trying to validate or is this business in a position where it can grow? And then, and then, if it is, the survey gives you a lot of good insights into how you should approach growth. So it's going to tell you, um, it's going to tell you what is the what is the key benefit that people who would be very disappointed without your product are actually getting. It's going to tell you how do they describe it when they recommend it to a friend, um, which gives you really good language to use for um, descriptive language of the product, and and then. Over time, I, I I tend to run multiple variations of the survey where uh, where I start to learn what are the what are the key segments that are more likely to be very disappointed without the product. So I start to learn targeting. Um, I start to learn what product would they use if they could no longer use this product. What would what would they use instead? And you know, a lot of times, if they say they'd be very disappointed without it. They say, I have no clue what I would use. And that's, so that's essentially telling you that it's a must have because it solves an important need and they don't know a good alternative. Um, if they say I'd be somewhat disappointed, a lot of times it's going to be, um, oh, I would just use product X instead. So the more that it's a kind of looked at as a commodity, the less likely it's a must have. It's just a nice to have. Um, but all of that essentially are the, the insights that I, I use to build the initial growth engine in the business. And so I think that's the, that's the step. You don't want to, you don't want to just jump into trying to grow the business. You need to, you need to um, figure out a, uh, a growth engine that works for the business before you try to grow the business. And so um, you, know, you might need a few people on the team for that, but you definitely are not massively trying to scale the, the, the team here. So um, you essentially, so pricing fits in with that. So your pricing model and your customer acquisition model, your target customer, and you have to essentially figure out what is the, what is the pricing model I need to fund the channels to acquire the right customers. And, um, 
are those channels viable for me? And so every time you test a new channel in the beginning until you find one that works, you might actually need to think of different ways that you have your pricing model. Maybe, maybe you need to be ultra premium. Maybe, maybe you need a, a super valuable free version of your product. And um, once you have a scalable single channel, then you're going to be a lot more fixed on, on some of those things. You're not going to have that flexibility, but in the beginning, trying to get something that will scale requires you to, uh, to kind of test across a lot of different variables. And so that's some of the things we talk about in the book, the language market fit, the really the, kind of the positioning side, the aha moment that like all, all of the getting, getting those pieces right are, are the essentials. And then once you identify at least one channel that scales, that works, then you start to move into operationalizing growth. And that's where, where you think about how do, how do we optimize different parts of the business? How do we test and grow the one channel that works? And then what are we doing to discover additional channels that would potentially work? And that, then you start moving more into something that looks like a, a more traditional business where um, some predictability and hitting growth targets becomes really important. Um, you know, once you're a public company, you definitely have to, to have to have that predictability. But even before you're a public company, um, if, if you, you know, you don't want to set expectations and then, and then come in at half of those, um, your, your CEO or your board of directors is going to bring down the CEO's neck. So, um, but it, it becomes easier to, to do some of that forecasting because you know that, you know, 75% of our target can be hit on, on, a lot of known growth drivers. And so we're going to need the unknown is around that 25%. What are we doing to test last quarter? If there was 25% and, and we hit it, then there's a good chance that our, our test learn process on that 25% is going to be, is going to be, you know, more predictable if we've done it well quarters in the past. So of, of any growth target, what percentage came from the unknown things at the beginning of the quarter. And so that's more and more you start moving into just trying to have like predictable growth and a predictable business. But, um, you know, so we don't talk a lot about that in the book either. So a, a lot of this is, um, is you know, we're, we're covering the somewhat building that initial growth engine, um, the, the need to have product market fit. And then we talk about growth teams um, but yeah, obviously it, it would need to be a thousand pages for us to, to cover everything in there. So but those are some of the other pieces. Yeah. Yeah. And I think really people are most interested in this topic like to read about when they are getting started. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm sure once you've hit a certain amount of your stride, what you do from there becomes a little more, a little more clear. Um, you know, or you can kind of figure it out as you go. Um, so, you know, I think where you focused is certainly the place where, where many of us need help and it's where many companies fail. Um, yeah. So I know we only have a few minutes left and we could ask you because the even though the book's not a thousand pages, it's filled with so many gems. Um, was there anything that we didn't cover in this uh, set yeah. of questions yeah, one that of you the thought things, would be good to highlight? Yeah, one of the things I think would be actually really helpful for, for the audience you know, we we tried to get Morgan to come in and 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 help. Unfortunately, he's in on paternity leave uh, abroad right now, so it <laughs> makes it a little bit a, makes it a little bit harder to 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 contribute. But since we wrote the book, he he really has some interesting experiences working at both Facebook and uh, and now Shopify. And so, yeah, some of those you know, being able to do these things at massive scale and on on some of the like really successful growth companies of, of the, the past decade. Um, I, I think, you know, what will be a helpful resource for people who want to kind of dig into his insights on that, since we couldn't get him on this is um, the uh, podcast interview that I, I did. So if you go to breakout growth podcast and just look for the Morgan Brown interview, we, we talk a lot about, you know, some of, some of the, insights that he brings to the table after working with, with a couple of these really successful organizations. I think that that could be helpful for people as well. Oh, that's great. Yeah. We, we might be able to dig up that link and drop it here in the chat before. Uh, and if not, we'll certainly put it on our YouTube channel 
um because that is Perfect. that's a great re re resource that would be uh, nice to be able to share with people absolutely so, um, well sean i really appreciate you taking the time to do this show with us and it has been a real pleasure getting to read your book um and discuss it over the last month um we'll have well we're going to put together a nice super cut of all this so we can make a nice distilled um resource for people to be able to go back and enjoy the, the sort of key highlights. And oh. before we go, if someone wants to be able to work with you, because uh, there is only so much you can pack into a book, uh, <laughs> what would they do? Uh, yeah, if you if you go to seanellis.me, um, that's the website where I where I you know talk about the, some of the different things that I'm doing. But um, yeah, increasingly, that the, the areas that I focus on, uh, one, the, the go practice, uh, simulator is a, is just a great way to really roll up your sleeves and, and, and practice with real data on some of these things. Um, and, uh, so I have a partner who's a former data scientist from Facebook that I work with on that, who has great product management background. So we're super complimentary, but then, yeah, I love to work hands-on with companies as well. So, um, come in, uh, you know, reach out to me through, through, uh, my seanellis.me site where, you know, some, so if you're having some of those alignment issues, I can, I can talk about some of the programs I have there. And then my, I'm, I'm going back to doing some of the embedded work that keeps the skills really sharp and, and uh, companies that are just entering the post product market fit early growth stage. Um, I'm going to be working with a couple of companies per year in that stage. So um, if you, uh, if you're at that stage and you want to talk and see if I'd be a good you know, potential fit for that. And if it's a potential fit for my skills, that's a, uh, that's a conversation I love to have as well. Excellent. Well, again, thank you. And for all of those who've been enjoying the show with us, uh, one way we can say thank you to Sean for all that great time is we'll drop a link in the chat here to our, his book on Goodreads. Um, and so you've just taken the moment to read this book and it's while it's fresh in your mind, go drop him a review uh, for him and Morgan and help them get the, the book into the hands of more people who are interested in learning growth. Um, and until then, Sean, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Justin, and uh, wish you the best with UpFocus. You're doing some awesome work there as well. Thank you, sir. All right.